gentlemen and welcome to another episode of Behind the Bench. I am Rocco Granado from InLacrosseWeTrust.com. Gary Groob is on a three-week vacation to the Philippines with his wife to visit his family. So filling in for him is a very special guest and the song uh, kind of explains it all. A really good friend of mine I've known for many years. Uh, we've talked about him before. About some of the tragedy that he has he suffered, but he is with us, stronger than ever, from WaxPhilly.com, Kevin Nybauer. Kevin, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing better every day, Rocco, and before we get started, let me just thank you and Gary, especially you, for the kind words last week. That just completely blew me away. I didn't expect that at all. When I, when I was texting Gary, I, I didn't realize you guys were actually doing the show. So he basically gave you a live breakdown of what was going on with my conversation. Yeah. But anyway, thank you for having me. I got big shoes to fill with Gary being away, and I just hope I can uphold my end of this. Oh, uh, yeah, it, sh- it shouldn't be any problem yeah. <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah. It's not like we're bringing somebody on the street that's never watched the game of uh, lacrosse. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, yeah, I mean I you, you. you and I go back, oh, God, <laughs> years, decades. <laughs> yeah, back, actually, I took my first lady when I was in diaper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, uh, yeah, was 35 years, I guess. I yeah. Mean, well, since the wind started. Yeah. You know, back then. Yeah, so. So. So, so, so we go way back. Keep on keeping on, you know? Yep. That's what, that's what we got to do. Keep on moving. Uh, we get our team back in another 10 months. Our, our team. And, we'll, and we're, we're almost close enough to say one more day. We'll get rolling. Yeah, and that's why I tell, tell Gary every week. I say, it's not another week mm-hmm. closer to the. To the playoffs or the Champions Cup, it's another week closer to the to the Wings and the uh, San Diego Seals start to play again. All right. So, but let's get started with uh, some of the games last week. A couple big surprises last week. Okay, but definitely. Yeah, uh, yeah. A, a couple shockers. Um, well, I won't say a couple. I say one one shocker. The other game could really go either way, but um, for, let's get the ball rolling first with what went on Friday night, last Friday, in Colorado, in the Loud House. Uh, the Saskatchewan Rush visited Colorado. Now, this game meant so much to Colorado because even though it's early in the season, these teams only play each other three times. And they've already met once, and Saskatchewan won the game. A loss by Colorado would not only give Saskatchewan the season series, which means they would get all the tiebreakers, but it would essentially give them a a one-and-a-half game lead plus a game because of of the tiebreakers. So you're looking at two-and-a-half to almost three-game lead because they played later on that weekend. And you're only eight games into the season. And trying to pick up three games within the next ten with the way Saskatchewan's playing is kind of kind of difficult. Yeah, I, I agree. It seems as though, I mean, as, as talented as Colorado is, that they can beat every team in that league, but they don't know how to beat Saskatchewan. They yeah. don't just snake, but um, no matter how well they play, they just they just can't get it done. So I don't know now if it's a psychological edge that Saskatchewan's got. But the fact that they beat them again, like you said, now they, they're looking at pretty much a three-game lead. And, you know, Vancouver's coming in. To, in well, I'm getting ahead of myself. But, you know, it's, it, it, it just 
seems like they're fake, but they cannot beat that team. Yeah. And, and you know, they, they kind of needed it more for, you know, the message for, uh, you have to figure at some point they're going to beat the playoffs, probably the conference final. And, you know, if you go in there and you just can't believe you can beat this team, you know, it's, it's very self-defeating. Um, you know, and this, this is what the coaches get paid to figure out. And I don't know how you figure something like this out if, if you just can't beat them. No. You know, and, where do you go? And, and the game uh-huh. and the game started out pretty good. I mean, yeah, Stephen Keogh got the first goal of the game for Colorado a minute 21 in. And that was the only goal of the first quarter. Okay, Keogh, you know, let, let a shot go, you know, beat Evan Kirk, and, you know, they go up, you know, one nothing. Then, you know, Saskatchewan comes, comes back and, you know, Brian Keenan, Robert Church score, give them lead, and the game started to go up and back. You know, Col- uh, Saskatchewan put up a five spot in the second quarter, and Colorado put up three. And you go into the half, Saskatchewan up five to four. Still very much in Colorado's reach. Third quarter, complete, complete Colorado. Okay, so they take mm-hmm. they take an eight seven lead going into the fourth quarter with so, somewhat of, of momentum. I mean, Saskatchewan scored the last goal of of the third quarter, and it was short handed, but they were still controlling the tempo. Then it just seemed like the wheels just fell off the bus. Saskatchewan went on a what ended up being a four goal run, counting that last goal in the third quarter. Then Colorado scored the next two to tie the game up. But after that, ten, ten seconds after Joey Caputo tied the game, um, Matt Hasek put them up to stay, scoring a goal at 12.32. Uh, then Dinsdale got one at 13.08, and then Big Ben McIntosh, uh, Drexel alum, put in an empty netter with six seconds to go to give them a 13.10 win. Um, but, you know, you, you look at the rest of the numbers, okay? And, you know, when, when you look at it on paper, you're like, oh, you know, pretty evenly matched. And the game was. And Colorado should have won this game. I don't know what happened to them in the fourth quarter. It just seemed like everything completely fell apart. Uh, you know, Colorado had the shots, forty-nine to forty-five. Faceoffs were even, thirteen apiece. Uh, Saskatchewan went three for four in the power play. Colorado, two for five. But Saskatchewan also put in a shorthanded goal. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you would think, or at least I thought, when that shorthanded goal was scored, oh, here we go. You know, the momentum shift that the wheels are off, this is going to get ugly. And it actually, you know, even though they went on that run, Colorado was still very much in control of their own destiny. Yeah. And, you know, I, I thought they were going to fold up shop right there, but they didn't. They hung in there, and they just didn't, you know, they just couldn't get it to fall. And... That was the difference. Again, are they snake bitten or is it in their head or is it Saskatchewan just you know, two-time champion? They just know how to win when they need to. You know, it's, I guess we could debate that forever. But yeah, I, I think, like I said, I expected them to fold it up when they gave up that shorthanded goal. Yeah, I think Saskatchewan is on a mission this year after what happened to them in last year's final. I mean, I just think they're out to prove that what happened to them last year was a fluke. And, you know, not, not taking anything away from, from Georgia. Okay, they were a very strong team last year. But I think they're, they're making a statement saying, hey, that wasn't us in the finals. You know, that wasn't us. That wasn't Saskatchewan Rush lacrosse. This is how we play Rush lacrosse. And that's what they're doing. Uh, you know, you, 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 you look at the scoring breakdown. Uh, Curtis Knight, four assists. Robert Church, another solid night. Three goals, three assists. Ryan Keenan, four goals and an assist. Mark Matthews, even though he's not putting the goals in, he's getting the assists. Three assists on the night. Ben McIntosh with two and two. Uh, 
when you go over to Colorado, you got Ryan Benesh with three and two. Then you got uh, Jacob Ruiz with a goal and four assists, Stephen Keogh with three. And then Eli McLaughlin, Joey Caputo, and Zach Greer all, all with a goal apiece. Colorado is not going to win many games if you're just going to rely on Ryan Benesh and Stephen Keogh to score, in this case, 60% of your team's goals. You got Zach Greer from Saskatchewan for a reason. And with him only getting one goal and only two shots on net, something's not right. I agree. I, I, you know, it's, it's a big uh, puzzle with, with Zach Greer to share. What, what's going on with this guy? Um, I, I, and I'm sure you did too. We expected a lot more from him. We thought he could be a game changer, especially against the Saskatchewan. Yeah. Where, you know, he, he, he has that ability where he can take over a game if he wants to. And, he, and he's it's, done it. it just, it's not there for some reason. He's done it before. I you know, and I don't know why. And, I, you know, that's probably the million dollar question. If we knew why, we wouldn't be doing this. You right. know what I mean? I mean, he, he's done it before when he played with the Rush. He's taken over games and everything. But, you know, Joey Caputo won transition. You know, if he gets the ball, he's one of the fastest players, if not the fastest, in the NLL on transition. Okay? He, he just flies up, up the floor. I don't, even think his feet, I don't even think his feet hit the ground. Okay? Uh, uh, you know, so he, he gets a goal. E- Eli McLaughlin, he's got to be scoring more than just one goal. He got five shots on goal. But, like I said, Zach Greer, one goal, two shots, and that was it. While you're looking at Stephen Keogh and Ryan Benesh, six goals between them and a total of 19 shots. It's not, you know, they, you know 19 out of 49 shots came from those two players. Sadly, it, it, it looks like they're, they're becoming a one-trick pony. I mean, what happened to their offense? Well, you know, we're discussing Greer and, and, and all these guys, but you look at the stat sheet, where they at? You know, it's two shots for this guy, three for that guy, but 19 for two of them? Right. That, that just, that's a little boggling to me. I don't, you know, I don't yeah. know nobody else is putting shots on that. No. I mean, and, and a solid game by Jeremy Noble. Five assists, nine shots on goal. I, I mean, you know, he's he's picking up the, you know, the assists. I'm sure they would like to see some goals you know, by, by Noble as well. But something's going on with Zach Greer, and I don't know if it's still a nagging injury that's you know plaguing him from earlier in the season, but something's got to get. And, and on that, he seems to me to be at least in my eyes, he seems to be a step slower. He's just not blowing. You know, when you get a chance, you know, the good goal scorer, they just blow it away. When you know you got it open, you just blow away from their defender. He's just not doing that. No, uh, you know. So again, I, I, I kind of have to go on your corner with this one. I think there's some kind of an injury. That, uh, he's nursing. He didn't tell them, or they're not telling the media. But like I said, he, some of them guys, they just have that breakaway speed when needed, and he's always had it. Yeah, maybe, I, uh, it's not there. Yeah, I mean, maybe it was from an injury earlier in the season. It's still taking a little time for him to come back, but something's got to, you know, give some. I mean, they got to find some way to get him more than just two shots on net, especially if they want to have it. I mean, the chance of them getting first place right now with the way the Rush are playing is is going to be very difficult. So yeah, I, I mean, it, it, in my mind, it's just about locked up. I, I cannot see, especially they only have one game left between them. And Saskatchewan already won the tiebreaker, right? And so, like you were saying earlier, there's only maybe eight, nine games left. Ten games. It's just not going to. Right. I think just. I think maybe they realize, look, we got second place, good enough. Uh, like Calgary and Vancouver fight for that last spot, and you know we'll just. I don't know. I don't know why you would have that mindset, but it just seems like that's the way it's going to break out. They're going to get second. They maybe they're settled in their mind. That's what they want. Well, that's the problem there. They thought that last year, and what happened? <laughs> Vancouver jumped them. And, and this is what Colorado was uh, traditionally one of these teams that that happens to. They seem to always get a bad break when it's not. You know, at the end of the year when it looks like they got.
got this and they don't get that. You know, and they get the playoffs and they don't win. Yeah. You know, and, they can't get over that football over the home. You just don't know. I, I just don't understand why. Yeah. You know, I don't think any of us go. That's, you know, why if they play them every week and say, say, I hate to use a cliche, but that's why you got to play the game. Yeah. You know? Dylan Ward had a great game, stopped 32 out of 44. Unfortunately, he got the loss. Uh, Evan Kirk, who's yeah. been playing solid with that D in front of him, I mean, it, it, it that helps as well. Stopped 39 out of 49 shots and got the win. And that moved Saskatchewan to 6-1 and one and dropped Colorado to 4-2. and two. Now, that was Friday night. We go to Saturday. And you know what? We're, we're, we're going to jump right to... Saskatchewan's next game. Okay, that was on Saturday. They they returned home, and they were playing the Vancouver Stealth. Now this game, for for a second there, I thought Vancouver was going to win this game. I mean, I agree. I agree. I mean, it seems like Vancouver took advantage of. Saskatchewan leaving the morning of the game and a tired out Vancouver team. I mean, I mean, a tired and, uh, Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan did, never even had a chance to check into the hotel. No. The time the traveling was done, they went right to the rink. Yeah, and, and, they, and, they, you they, know, <laughs> and this has happened in this league before, and, uh, to Saskatchewan before. And you got to wonder why the league's, I guess, because building availability and whatnot, but that's, that's just brutal. That's cool. You know, and if we think back to the Rochester, Georgia game earlier in the year, you know, similar situation. You had to push the game back an hour and a half. Yeah. But, a- hour and a half, and then uh, Rochester got a two minute delay game call on top of it. Yeah. Yeah, to start the game short handed. Yeah, I, I kind of saw the humor in that. The game started an hour and a half late. Now you give me your delay of game. Delay of game, I, yeah. I, I, I could say, if I was a coach, I'd be like, really? But, but, I get a final league. Yeah, but, 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 but the thing is, Saskatchewan yeah. came right out and scored the first four goals of the game and jumped out to, to a 4 nothing lead right away. I mean, yeah, we're, we're 42 seconds into the second quarter, and before you know it, you know, four nothing Saskatchewan. Uh, you know, Reese Dutch finally got on the board. You know, brought it within four to one. Then, yeah, you know, Saskatchewan scores again. They go up five one. Then, you know, Vancouver and Saskatchewan they they started alternating goals up and back two two yeah you know, two goals apiece going up and back until um, Vancouver tied it. Logan Shush tied it with about 27 seconds left in the, in the third quarter. Ties it at nine. But then, again, this happens to Vancouver so much. I mean, this is a franchise that has only 10 road wins in their franchise history since they moved to Vancouver. 10 road wins, that's it. Curtis Knight scored with one second to go in the third quarter to put him up ten to nine, and then you know he scored the game, uh, the the final goal at nine fifty five of the fourth. But I mean Vancouver is is there; they just can't get over that hump or put 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 anybody away. Vancouver is in a lot of ways similar to Colorado where they have it's a firepower they just they just seem to get misfire uh, and Logan Shuss he's just been great all year no one's heard of him you know basically because of that record he when he's had another four he had a four goal like two assists two power play goals but that's it that's basically what they had uh, McCready with two goals and it is, you can't win if you're only getting points from three guys and, 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 and your goaltending earlier in the year was a big question mark. Penny has kind of solved the, uh, the problem for now. But again, like you were saying, Vancouver's one of these teams that just can't seem to get it done. No. And, yeah, again, scratch your head. That's, that's the beauty of this league. Well, we, we, you know, we, we'll, we'll put our predictions up every week on who's going to do what. We're lucky if we get half of them. Yeah. And, and 
you know, we'll get the one of the games later to like shock everybody, like how that happened. But you know, like I said, Vancouver, like you said, they have, they just they have the talent. They hang in every game. They rarely get blown out. It does happen, but it's rare that they get blown out. They're, they're in the games right to the bitter end, but they just, it's a difference between winning and losing. I don't, you know, I, I don't think they have plugged into that. Um, you know, they had probably their biggest win in franchise history a few weeks ago, and I thought they would build off of that, but they haven't. They haven't, no. So, and you know, I don't know, you know, if we had these answers, but we don't. We don't know. And when, you know, when we talk about Zach Greer on Colorado, you have to talk about Reese Dutch on Vancouver. He is not the Reese Dutch that he's been in the past. Another game with just a goal and just five shots. Uh, Corey Small, ten shots and only three assists. Logan Shush, four goals on eleven shots. Uh, you know. Uh, McCready, two goals, seven shots. Reese Dutch is getting five shots, only putting one of them in the net. And I think what these teams are doing is they're keying on Dutch and saying that if if you're going to beat us, you're going to have to beat us with your other players. Because they ain't letting Dutch get a thing going. You just... He's just not getting on track, and I, I think I think really you one hundred percent. I think team is just keying on. You know right? Look, he's not going to beat us. Um, we're going to shut him down. You're going to beat us. You got to have somebody else do it. You know, it's if he's the man, and if you can double him and see what Smaller McCready can do, and that's basically been the, the script for the season. And the other downside or the other issue with that is the defense isn't the best. You know, you're, 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 you know, you're going to play that type of tic-tac game. You don't have the defense to do that. And I think teams know it. They're, they're taking advantage of the goaltending situation. Right. And not the greatest defensive team in the world. No. So so I agree with you. You, 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 tie, you tie down, you put your best defender on Dutch. You, know, you can take your chances. I Corey Small can score eight goals. We're going to score ten. Right. doesn't matter. And I mean, uh, they, they had Tyler Carlson play the whole game. They, they gave Evan Kirk a rest, and they let Carlson play this entire game, and he played very well. As much as me and Gary bust on Tyler Carlson, okay, for just being a door opener and just being able to count the five and, and everything else, when he's asked to step up and step in between the pipes, he's one hell of a goalie. I, I, he is, and I, I looked at, uh, we can probably get into this later, but I've been watching the goalie situation, and I, I'll, I'll bring this up later with expansion and the goalies. But, you know, Carlson and uh, Penny, these guys are like backups coming in and standing on their head, showing you, hey, I belong, I belong in this league. You know, they're showcasing their talents. But like you said, I, I've been one of the ones back in the days when we did the other show. You know, we, we heard Carlson and we would all start giggling. Right. Yeah, what's he doing now? What, what, uh, he's pretty good at holding that door open. Yeah. And, you know, he kind of made us see the wrong words last week. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he did. And I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. I mean, he, play, he played a great game. I mean, we're still going to bust on him because, the, the, re, the you know, Kevin, the reason we bust on him so much it's because of the coach. When you really take a, a look back, okay? Last year, how many times was this rush team up by like 10 to 12 goals with, let's say, nine minutes to go in a game? Okay? And they didn't bother to take out, at the time, Aaron Bold and put in Carlson to finish the game out. And uh, yeah, I agree. That's after all the head scratch, you know. And uh, we we have said it uh, many times. Why is this guy in this game? Right. You know, get, get him out of there. Nothing good can come out of leaving bold in a game that you're leading by nine, ten goals with eight minutes left. Exactly. Nothing good can come out of that. Oh, and oh, oh, just, the only thing that come out of it is bad. To his system, and he wouldn't take him out. Right. The only thing that come could come out of it is bad. You know. Yeah. A, tw- a twinge this way, a twinge that way. You could tear a knee, whatever. You know. And Dave Larusio, or um, he's from Buffalo, and he's 
perfect example. He comes in, he plays 20 seconds, he gets hurt. Right. That could happen to your starter. Exactly. Uh, if your starter goes down, good luck. You know, you're, you're, you're struggling to get to 500 with a quality starter. Now you got, you know, he got lucky with Carlson. If the kid played great, but he should have been in there a lot more than he has been. Right. And, and like, yeah, I mean, again, and we used to say it. There is again opening the door. Right, or yeah. Nine, but he's, he's holding that door. Now, um, now, now, if you look at Saskatchewan's roster, how they balance their scoring. Okay, Curtis Knight, Robert Church, Ryan Keenan, Mark Matthews, Ben McIntosh, all two goals apiece. Okay, Knight added two assists, Ryan Keenan added two assists, Mark Matthews with another four assists. Now, I left Robert Church out, he had five assists, okay, that's a seven-point night for him, plus a six-point night the night before. Now, this may sound favoritism because he went to Drexel, local college here. I covered Drexel for during the NCAA season. I watched him play through his Drexel career. But where is it written in the NLL rulebook that the most valuable player has to be the player with the most points? Uh, again, um, I agree. Well, we were last season when uh, I kind of, I had brought it up, but I found that I wasn't groundbreaking or anything. We were talking about uh, that tip of Georgia now. And I, I just lost his name. He played for the wing for a while. Um, he's jo- not playing this year. Jordan Hall. Um, Jordan Hall, card, thank you. I, I was saying at the beginning of the year that Jordan Hall, if Georgia is going to go as far as Jordan Hall takes him. Right. And, and, and you guys, I'm, you know, I I was shocked because I thought I was the only one I was thinking that. And you guys were like, no, you're right. That guy, to me, he, he, there was a great argument for him for MVP. Yeah. You know, and I agree with you. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be the leading goal scorer because more often than not, they're not the most valuable player. Just the, the guy with the golden touch. You know, somebody's got to get that guy the ball, and somebody's got to break the ball down coming the other way. You know, the ultimate team situation. So I agree. With, I always had an issue with the leading scorer being the MVP. I mean, if, if you look at his stats from last year, the consistency is there. And I'm not talking about, oh, one goal, one assist every single solitary game. I'm talking two and four, two and five, three and three, four and two. Yeah. Yeah, two, like I said, two and five in this case, three and three the night before. I mean, mm-hmm. thirteen points in two games. I mean, come on. I mean, you got to start looking at the consistency that these players are. Okay, great. Dane Smith broke uh, the point total, and you know, and, and everything else. But where did his team end up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate to keep saying another one trick pony. You finally got, you know, some help, but he is, that's it. But, you know, they have four wins, but I, I would not consider King Smith in any kind of MVP talk. Right. Because most valuable player, to me, generally translates to a very successful team. There's a reason he's a most valuable player on a very good team. Right. Yeah, yeah. You, you rarely see a last place team have an MVP. It, it happens, but I don't think it happens. You know, it's just not something that goes like, oh, we're going, you know, we're going to give somebody from Vancouver an MVP. Well, you won one game. Right. So how valuable was he? Right. You, know, you give him a team MVP, but like yeah, again, this guy put up 13 points in, in two nights against one, Colorado, one of the better teams in the league, and Vancouver hooped right there. They were, I mean, they're not that far away from being good. They just got to figure things out. Yeah. So you put 13 points up against two quality opponents, you've you got to get some consideration. Yeah. And it, it's not like it was a, a one weekend thing. He's been doing it, like you said, all year. Three goals, four assists, four goals. You know, it's not, like you said, one and one. It's, it's noticeable every night. How many goals did he get tonight? Uh, it's harking back to the Tavares days. You know, you knew exactly. he was going to get four or five right. every game. I mean... And, the Saskatchewan offense is at 123 goals right now. 
Okay? The Toronto Rock are the next closest at 108. I mean, you know, 123 goals in eight games. That's... <laughs> That's unreal. I mean, so with that with that win, Saskatchewan goes to seven and one. The loss drops Vancouver to one and seven. Okay, now this goes back to what we were talking about with Colorado. With that win, Saskatchewan seven and one. Colorado's four and two. That means Colorado is now two games behind Saskatchewan, plus also. They lose the tiebreaker, which means that they have to win the division outright. So they got to gain three games on Saskatchewan, and they have a total of 12 games remaining. Okay, they have two games in hand on on Saskatchewan. So if they could win both those games, that will help, because that will bring them within a game, plus the other game for the tiebreaker. That will, you know lessen the lead, but it's going to be tough. It really is. Uh, and yeah. I agree. And one of those 12 games is Saskatchewan again. Right. I mean, if there was ever a must win, that, I mean, you, that is the absolute must. If they have any shot of the division, which is right now very, very unlikely, but they absolutely have to win that game. Yeah. And, I mean, and, and Saskatchewan's got to lose two or three games along the way. Who's going to beat them? Yeah, exactly. You know, That's the. You know, maybe they lose one, maybe two. I don't see them losing three. Yeah. But then again, that wasn't that long ago. We were all saying, "Who's going to beat them? They're going to go sixteen and out. They're going to say, you know, we're all we're fickle." I know I am. Yeah. That's whatever you've done for me lately. Mm-hmm. Me. Right. I just don't see. I don't see three teams beating them. No. It's going. It's, it's going to be tough. Yeah. Now. Another game we had on Saturday night, which had me shaking my head, sitting here watching it, and I know Gary was in the stands, shaking his head and just not believing what was going on. Um, And maybe it's a good thing that he's in the Philippines right now, because the man would go off with this game. The, The Calgary Roughnecks... Keyword rough. They roughed up the Toronto Rock sixteen to eight in this game. the The whole entire game was up and back. Okay, Calgary came into Toronto and took Toronto's best punch. Every time Toronto came at them. Calgary came right back. Okay? Toronto throw a hook. Toronto, Calgary would duck and come in with an uppercut. It it just put them on their toes. Toronto didn't know what to do in this game. I mean, it was that it was that evenly matched. You know, but you know, before you, you realized it, you're going into the final quarter and Calgary's up nine to eight. Yeah, so Toronto fans are thinking, "Yeah, we could do this. Won't be a problem." Well, I guess they didn't expect um, Curtis Dixon to wake up because the man, the man went off. He scored. Yeah, tw- yeah. The last goal in the third quarter, and then started the fourth quarter. He ended up having, let me see, how many did he have on the night? He had four on the four. night. Okay. Four and two. Yeah, four, four and two. two. But, oh, two assists, yeah. But Calgary scored all seven goals in the final quarter and the last nine of the game. Calgary was down eight to seven. And they just. Scored, scored the next nine. The the Toronto mascot couldn't even watch. Yeah, I, I was I, I was just thinking of that. I was going to bring that up. That Gary put that picture up. It's so bad in the fourth quarter. Even Iggy can't watch. Yeah. And uh, I, that, I mean I, that right there was a thousand words. Just that picture. <laughs> this is bad. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the and if you look at the game stats, 
you would not be able to guess that score because the shots on goal, Toronto had the 55-52. Loose balls, Toronto had that. Power play, you know, it was three or five for Calgary, one or three for Toronto. So if you look at that number, you're thinking, oh, this is a 10-9, 10-8 game. Right. Then you look at the score, and then, you know, I look down, oh, what did Superman do, Tom Schreiber? 13 shots on goal, one goal. How does that, I mean, and also Toronto shot collection, they, they got back into the bad habits they had last season where they are shooting the ball from their own banks pretty much. From, from, from anywhere, yeah. From everywhere. And, you know, I guess, you know, whatever happens there, but they battled that for a lot of the last season and they got through that. But this, I don't think there's any, this is as bad as the Vancouver upset of Saskatchewan. No one, but no one saw this coming. Even if you said Calgary may win this game, it's going to be a one goal game. It's going to be a last second goal. It's not going to be. I mean, how is. You go into Toronto, you hit them with everything. You outscored them 7 to 0 in the fourth quarter in their building? Yep. <laughs> wow. In their building, 7 0 in the final They're, quarter, but 9 nothing. Nine in a row. Nine in a row. I mean, and, you know, you, you started. Going on the numbers with you know Tom Schreiber with only a goal. Yeah. You also had Adam Jones with just one goal. Brett Hickey just one goal. Uh, you know Rob Hellyer had his hat trick, but he had eleven shots. Hick- Hickey had six shots. Jones had seven. Schreiber thirteen shots with just a goal. So th- they shut down some of some of that high powered offense and. This is a team that I believe the week prior, or two weeks prior, it may have been, that they put a hurt on on the New England Black Wolves, twenty-one to nine. Yeah. And all of a sudden yeah, they yeah, turn in. The, the, the three touchdowns and extra points to three field goals. Right. Yeah, that's. And and, 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 and how many goals? Uh, I, I believe Toronto had a hundred goals coming into that game, yeah. and they scored twenty two or three times already. Exactly. And, and, and you get eight. I mean, wow. Yeah, and I mean, when Gary and I started to make our selections, we both kind of like skipped over this game because we were like, okay, Calgary was you know only sitting at one and five. And, I, and and we were both like, you know, they really haven't shown me anything until they do. We're going the other way. We're not even going to do this. Yeah, you know, and they're playing in Toronto with the depth Toronto has. Toronto should win this. This might be another twenty goal game. And here mm-hmm. it was almost a twenty goal game the other way. The other way. And it, what's funny is we on the last story. I don't want to put that out there, but on on our page we we do our prediction. And I, I figured I'd be a wise guy, and I put Toronto Calgary. Really, final score: Toronto three hundred and forty-three, Calgary eight. eight. Nick Rhodes with a half trick. <laughs> and you know, and of course, I'm getting I, deservedly so. They're spanking me for that. Said, Come on, man! It was a joke. I mean, how do you going into that game not knowing how it's going to end? How do you take that game serious? The way Toronto have been playing. And as bad as Calgary has been playing, and you, you just back now, you made my point, and Gary, there's, there's no point even talking about this game. And, you know, but there you go. Now we're, we're talking probably more about this game than any other game. Yeah. And we thought this would be a, a poo play. We didn't talk about that game. Uh, Toronto smoked them. What's the big deal? Uh, so, Schreiber had 15 goals. And, yeah, I really expected something like that where some of the old kinds of records set because. You know, um, Calgary's goaltending has for years been questionable. Right. And, you know, and Del Bianco, he's finally playing like I thought he would. I mean, he's only 20 years old, so he's still learning the game. Yeah. But, you know, he, I mean, in the Canadian leagues, he, he played great in the summer. And then he comes in, and, you know, it's a different league. I get all that. He's 20 years old. He's not going to get his time for four or five more years. But maybe, you know, this is the thing that gets them started. And that would be great for Calgary. That's what they need. They need somebody who's going to save them, who's still in the game. And, you know, one of those paid games against a better opponent where the goaltender is just pulling uh, Dallas Elliott. He's right. on his head. He's, you know, backwards. You get the hit with shots. And they find a 
find a way to win. And maybe they'll be on, like I said earlier, I've been watching the goaltenders because a lot of guys are going to be exposed in that season. And I, I, one of the Calgary goalies is going to be exposed. Yeah. And actually, he just made a great statement. You know, can, can, the question now is can he follow this up? And can Calgary follow this up? Was Calgary that good? Toronto that bad? Yeah, that, that's the problem. I mean, you don't know what Calgary team is going to show up from one game to, you know, to the next. And they've been like that for two or three seasons now. Yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, how, which, exactly, which Calgary are we getting? The good one or the bad one? Or the bad one, right. And, it, and, <laughs> and it's an ongoing, ongoing joke, I, I should say, with, with Gary and I that, you know, Calgary and Vancouver... Who doesn't want to get into the playoffs? Yeah, you know, could you? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's, I, I agree. It's like, they both have golden opportunities to get in. I mean, and they just drop one when they shouldn't. Yeah, I mean, two two years ago, Vancouver could have locked it up early in the season when Calgary started. I think zero and six or zero and seven, but Vancouver couldn't get on any type of uh, a winning streak. To start putting distance between them. Yeah, they, they couldn't get two in a row. No. And they'd get one and they would lose two. Or they'd lose three and they'd get another one. Yeah, they, they, they just I, couldn't do anything. I remember that. I went seven and, you know, how does this happen? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's just weird. Now, the last game we had on Saturday, we just got done talking about Buffalo and talking about Dane Smith and, you know, him not... You know, just because he's, you know, people get the most points, not be the, you know, the MVP and things of that nature. Well, to piggyback on that, Buffalo shuffled their way into the old War Memorial Blue Cross Arena at Connor and Ferris Field. And they defeated the Rochester Nighthawks 16 to 14. Now, Kevin, if you remember, Rochester started out 2-0 yes, in the season. I and both their first two wins were very strong statement wins. And, you know, they were doing the same thing Saskatchewan was doing. And we're sitting here thinking, wow, we're going to have a rematch, Saskatchewan and Rochester for the Cup. Because they just started putting themselves above and beyond everybody. Well, since then, Rochester has lost five in a row. They are now two and, four, two and five, last place in the East, while the Buffalo Bandits move to four and three and sit only a half a game out of first place. All this. Go, go, go figure that one. All this. This, this, game, this game I looked at is this is going to be Rochester's, you know, coming back party. And I looked at the two rookies because in the beginning of the year when they started 2 0, I was big on Jake Withers just making all the difference in the world. He's stopping teams from going on runs because he's winning that face off. And he's keeping the Rochester runs going for the same reason. He's winning those faceoffs. So I'm looking at this game. All right, well, Josh Byrne, he's been quiet. You know, the number one pick. He hasn't done really much this year. And I'm thinking, well, Willers is going to, you know, dominate faceoffs. And, well, boy, I couldn't have been wronger on that one because, uh, you know, Withers was what he was. But Byrne had a, a six-point night with five goals and Dane Smith. Who, you know, we mentioned him before, but he's been kind of up and down and hot and cold. Uh, one night he's great, and what did he get, 11 points? Um, you yeah. Know, I think it was, he had 11, three 11 goals, yeah. Eight assists. Yeah, three and eight. Now, he, he, he'll go three games and get eight points in three games. That's just, uh, but that, that is what it is with Buffalo. And, you know, they they got the injury bug a little bit, but I can't believe it. Hats off to them for having the four wins and being a half a game out because they've had a lot of adversity. Um, Bouquet is great at home, but on the road, he's 
he's horrible. Uh, the last two weeks ago, he, he poured goals on six shots. I can't find anybody on the face of the earth that knows where those two saves came from. Yeah, you, you and Gary discussed that last week. Where did the two saves come from? He didn't save anything. Yeah. But, you know, and then last week, the different Alex Bouquet, the, you know, the MS, uh, WLA Bouquet came out, played well. He, he's well at home, but again, with the goalies, I hate to keep bringing this up. The better the goalie, the better the team. You look at the winning team, Saskatchewan, outstanding goal tanning. Colorado, uh, uh, which is, uh, yeah, just the goaltending yeah. is the key to this league. And it's so hit and miss when backups are coming in and stealing jobs from the starters. And, and, and it's reflecting in the standings. Yeah, and, so, and this game was just... It, it, it was up and back. It really was. I mean, it was typical Buffalo-Rochester. Um, you know, Rochester took advantage of, you know... Of penalties, they went three for six on the power play. Uh, Buffalo goes one for two. Rochester outshot Buffalo. Uh, Buffalo picked up six more loose balls. Uh, faceoffs were completely Rochester, uh, twenty-two to twelve. But when when you look you know, and you, you break down the scoring, you got Corey Fitterelli with four goals, Joe Resitaris with two and four. Graham Hasek with two goals. Uh, Brad Gillis, Austin Shanks, uh, Jake Withers, Luke Magnin, all with one goal. Uh, Kyle Jackson with two. One name I didn't mention that without any, any goals is Cody Jamison. He had four assists, but he also took ten shots. Now, I don't know if Cody is forcing his shots, gripping the stick a little bit too hard, trying to force things out. I don't know. But since the beginning of the year, he's been going hot and cold. Uh, you know, Dan Dawson was another one, only two assists. So they shut down the dangerous one. Cody Jameson didn't have any goals. And, you know, Kyle Jackson only had two. So they, they left it all on Vitarelli getting the four and said, okay, everybody else is going to have to score. So I don't know what's going on. Uh, I know Mike Hazen is not happy. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be right now if I was him. You know, you start out 2-0, you lose your last five. You lose this tough one to Buffalo. Now you have to play Toronto this week at home. A Toronto team that is pissed, to put it to put it lightly. <laughs> yeah, I mean Rochester has the firepower, but you know they didn't do it. One name that's missing from that Buffalo roster. It was a, that he was scratched last week was Pat Saunders. Now I looked on the transaction wire, and this might be uh, helpful for Vancouver because on February fifth, on Monday, the Bandits traded Pat Saunders to the Vancouver Stealth in exchange for Thomas Ogarth. Now. Pat Saunders had playing time with the Swarm at one point, with the Philadelphia Wings, then, you know, with the New England Black Wolves, then he went to, um, got Buffalo. Yeah it, yeah, it seems like he has, you know, a season or two here, here, and here, and he okay. goes, goes from place to place. Uh, I, I thought there may have been a season in Toronto or this yeah, game. Probably, I could be yeah. mistaken on that, but I seem to associate that. Yeah, I'm, I haven't seen him anywhere. I'm just my, my feeling is I thought he did play there. Yeah, I, I, I think he did. I was just going right off the top of my head. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I know. But, but now, is that Pat Saunders or Pat Sanders, the guy that scored the overtime goal a couple of weeks ago, according to NLL TV? That was Pat Sanders, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we won't get into that. Yeah, but now, now Vancouver picking up 
you know, Saunders, that might add a little more scoring punch there. And, and it's also some veteran leadership. Like I said, he's been to quite a few teams, and he contributes where he goes. He's, he's not going to, you know, five or six goal a game, not a guy, but he's contributing. And I think, I agree with you. That, that's a big pickup for Red Cougar. I think he's a, a calming uh, force. On there, I mean, like, which, like we said earlier, they're double teaming Dutch or whatever they're doing the Dutch to get him out of it. This is one more option that Vancouver surely needs. I think this is a really good move. I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to what brought it about because you don't, uh, you know, as well as I do, you don't see many trades in the NL, no. especially not in the season. No, and, and I, so, you know, maybe it's a work-related item, or in general, you know, that's you know, that's just usually what it is. Somebody's working, and they, you know, they can't get to the games, right? And you know, they help them out. But it's just a curious move to me. Um, well, I know I don't I, know what Hogarth is going to bring to Buffalo. I don't know. Uh, but if my memory serves me right, I believe Saunders plays for the Langley Thunder in the WLA in the summertime. I believe you're correct. So. Maybe, you know, might have something to do with it. Maybe he got a job in Vancouver over the summer. And, you know, while he plays for for Langley. And maybe yeah, it's job related I, now. I, I, I'm on the same avenue with this. I think there's probably a work thing or, a, you know, a, a family thing. And if you know, if you look at the Vancouver game last week, uh, I'm, I forget which one. I think uh, one of the games, maybe both. Uh, Hogarth was scratched. Yeah. So I'm not sure what's been. I'm not sure who. I don't know who he plays for in the WLA, but I know he's in there somewhere. But uh, I caught my head. He, he was scratched, and then he got traded. So. Uh, again, we we don't know these things, but we can, you know, we know the history of the league. It's probably a work thing or a family relocation type thing, because you know it doesn't happen much. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, it, the Bold and Kirk move, which I still can't believe that uh, Bold is playing every game for the one. Well, that's uh, there must be some kind of a arrangement because. Yeah, you know the story with him. He's living out in Edmonton, and you know it's like a twelve-hour flight, a, you know, a flight and drive. It's like a twelve-hour trip one way. Yeah, yeah, because he because there's no direct flights in the way he has to go. He has to like go to Toronto first, and then go from Toronto to to Boston, and then drive. I think they said from Boston to to Connecticut. So it's kind of you know. And I think that's, you know, that was similar to what Saskatchewan had this week because some point apparently, uh, I was reading it briefly because I was prepping for tonight, and some of the one flight that they would normally get has been canceled. So they had to fly in and they had a bus in for like eight hours. And, you know, but getting back to the bolt, and, and I was surprised. I actually really thought, and I think. We all probably did that. Uh, he was going to get traded on draft day for that number eight pick, and it never happened. No, no. I think the price might have been too high at the time, and they were just waiting for the right, yeah, you know, the the right deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, well said. Yeah. So Saunders, I, you know, I, I, again, I think getting back to that, I think that's a good move for Vancouver. Yeah, and I, I, Buffalo, I, Buffalo has been very active now. They, they have signed a couple of players to the practice squad. Uh, actually, that happened, I believe, two weeks ago. I don't know what help they're going to be. Um, one was Zach Haywires, and the other one is Bill O'Brien. Um, I talked to Bill. He told he might get activated this week, but uh, against New England, it would probably be a good move to get the crowd right after the game. But I haven't heard whether he's been activated or not. Yeah, there's nothing, no, nothing yet, and I'm pretty sure that uh, we'll we'll know first from from Bill before before it's posted up on 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 NLL. <laughs> yeah, because we, we we know how active uh, I'll call him Mr. O'Brien uh, yeah. is on Twitter. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the man is very intimidating. Okay, but. When when you talk to him, 
He's one of the best guys you would ever want to talk to. Uh, yeah, he is the, the great guy. Yeah. Now, but here's the question, Rock, a, a great guy, does that translate into making a difference in a season? Because I don't think the man has ever scored a goal. Um, well, no, he. So, yeah, no. he's a defensive force. Don't you know? I, I give you that. Well, no, he. Well, wait a minute. Now, hold it. You, you mentioned about oh, he hasn't scored a goal. Okay. Answer me a question. What do you think about Brett Manning on defense? You know, I don't know why I was just after I said it and you brought that up. Uh, yeah, Brett Manning maybe. I would say I, I would rank Brett Manning as the second or third best defenseman in the league other than uh, maybe Dawson. And there, there's a few other ones. I mean, that's yeah. apples and oranges. Who's your best? But yeah, right. you're right. Brett Manning, certain guys are not there to score. Right. I mean, he... Who, He'll get his one goal a year or maybe two, okay? But it's very rare you see him cross over the center line. Very rare, okay? We also, we, we spoke earlier on the year, you and I, about Buffalo needs to score goals. Yeah. So, so you know, that's kind of what I was getting at. He's not going to put the ball in the net. No. And, again, and I mentioned Bouquet, yeah, yeah, you need help on defense. So, that's an, and whether or not he's activated, we don't know. And that's you know, kind of a moot point at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, that was an interesting trade, to say the least. And I don't know what Hogarth is going to bring to the table for him, but we'll see. Yeah, well, um, we'll, we'll have to see. So, now, with, with that last game, here's how the standings shoot up. In the West, Saskatchewan seven and one, Colorado's four and two, two games out. Calgary's at two and five, four and a half out. Vancouver one and seven, six games out. You go to the East. New England is back up top at four and two, followed by Toronto and Buffalo, both at four and three, only a half a game out. Georgia at three and three, one game out. And Rochester, who is currently on a five-game losing streak, sits at two and five, two and a half games out. So that that's where we stand right now with some of these teams playing six between six to eight games so far this season. Now we look at the games that are coming up this week. And we are in there we go. Fe- February 9th. It, yeah, it starts tomorrow night. You got... Yeah, we got six games this weekend, yeah. which is... A bit, it, it's not just six games, but when you see the matchups, yeah. there's going to be a lot of... There could be a lot of movement or a lot of separation in the East. Because the East is on a very... Big schedule this week. I'm 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 just going to run through the matchups real quick, and then we'll go through see who who wants who. Sure. You tomorrow night you got Buffalo at New England. That's at 7:30 p.m. Then you then you have. Let me just do something here real quick. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Okay, you got Buffalo at New England tomorrow night at 7:30. Then on Saturday, Georgia goes to Buffalo. So Buffalo will return home to face the Georgia Swarm at 7.30. Toronto goes to Rochester. Again, like we said, Toronto's a little PO'd right now after their game against Calgary. Rochester's on that five-game losing streak. Then you have the Twitter game of the week, which is Colorado at Calgary. That should be a classic. Especially the way Calgary played last week. They may get a nice little game up, you know, closer to, to, to Colorado. And then on to finish the schedule on Saturday, you got Saskatchewan at Vancouver. So, you know, who knows? That could even put Colorado further in the hole, depending on the outcome of those two games. Then on Sunday, so we have games Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Sunday night, 6.05, Rochester travels to Georgia. So Rochester's got to face Toronto at home. Then they got to go down to Georgia 
immediately following the game and face last year's champions. They cannot afford to go 0-2 this weekend. They cannot. I mean, if, if they do, even if they go 1-1, I would have to start thinking that Mike Hazen has to be looking over his shoulder, waiting for Kurt Styers to tap him, tap him on his, his shoulder and say, uh, Mike, clear out your office. I mean, so, so, something's not right, you know. So they're 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 the matchups now. To go through them, yeah, you know, real quick to see how who we think's going to do what. Uh, Buffalo is at New England. Uh, basically, th- th- this game is for first place when when you look at it, because Buffalo is only half a game out. Uh, Buffalo has been somewhat. Somewhat. Move it up and do what, what what they need to do. Um, I'm still I'm still going to go with New England playing at home, and you know just the depth that they have right now uh, with Kevin Crowley and Sean Evans. I think they're going to they had you know the week off. Um, I know Kevin was at the parade today, the Eagles Super Bowl parade. Um, I, I I see them being rested and. Doing what they need to. So I, I'm, I'm taking New England in this game. Yeah, I agree. Um, a, a couple of reasons is, um, as I mentioned, our bouquet is has not been so good on the road. New England's rested. Yeah, I, I, I give it to New England, but I don't think I think it's going to be a battle. I, it's, you know, they're they're going to fight to the very end. But New England, I think they just they're they're too strong for Buffalo right now. Um, and I just think they, they, they find a way to win this one at home. Yeah, yeah. New England will get this, give them a little little cushion yeah. between them and Buffalo uh, for first place. Now, on Saturday, this game is going to be tough. Georgia goes to Buffalo. Buffalo is very tough at home. The crowd there in Buffalo at, at the Key Bank Center uh, kind of reminds me of the crowd that used to get when the odd was around. And, uh, Kevin, we know what that crowd was like back in, uh, 94. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it was not, it was not a very friendly, uh, confine for the opposition. I no. guess it's putting it nice. No. Yeah. And it's still going to be Kevin, the same that, way. That's going to be a wild building. But, but I, I think in this game here, uh, with Buffalo having to go through a battle the night before, Georgia being rested, Georgia's been playing a lot better than than the record indicates. I'm thinking Georgia's going to win this game. I see Lyle Thompson exploding on the scene uh, for Buffalo. Um, and even though they traded Pat Saunders, I think it's going to show. I know he's not your five, six goal scorer a night, but you know, they're gonna to have to, you know, do something. I I don't yeah, see I, Buffalo I, winning this game. Yeah, I think that um we talked earlier about travel constraints and Buffalo is coming out of New England. And, you know, that's a like a two or three hour ride to Boston or wherever you want to go. You're going to have a tough game. That's going to be a physical game Friday night. And anyway, look at it. It's a divisional battle. George is rested. And, you know, George has got this tendency this season to just, well, we'll keep it close until late third quarter and we'll get our sixth goal run and blow it up. And they've been, when they're winning, that's what they're doing. They're just, you know, keeping the game one, two goals and then they blow it up and it's like, oh, okay, let's wake up. Okay, we want us to go home. And I think that, that, Scenario was going to play out again. I think just George is going to wind up winning that game. Just be, just there's too many things in their favor and not in the Buffalo favor. No. Now, so we're both going to go with Georgia on that one. Now you got Toronto visiting Rochester. This is a game I mentioned earlier in the show. You got a pissed off Toronto team 
going in and facing a struggling Rochester Nighthawk team. I, I just have this feeling that Toronto is going to put a hurt on Rochester on Saturday night. I just, I mean, as, uh, yeah, as much as I like the Nighthawks and I think they have a solid team, the way they've been playing as of late, just, I don't know. I mean, Dan Dawson seems to be going hot and cold. Uh, Cody Jameson hasn't been consistent as of late. And, yeah, Toronto had that one little stumble last week. And I think they're going to want to come out and, you know, put it all out on the line, you know, in this game. And I I, 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 I just see Toronto in, in it, winning this game. I mean, as, as good as Matt Vince is, uh, I, I don't know. I think the depth on, on Toronto, Hellier, Hickey, Adam Jones, yeah. Tom Schreiber, I think they, they get back on track. I don't you, yeah. I, I, I don't see you keeping them, you know, keeping Adam Jones, Tom Schreiber, um, it'd be Hellier or Hickey, keeping them down to just one goal two weeks in a row. That ain't happening. Uh, I, I, I agree with her, but I think uh, the player of the game, I think, and this one's going to be Adam Jones. I think he's going to have a four or five goal night. He's going to be everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but they are going to be. Like they said, you're, they're, they're pretty, they got held to one goal. Yeah. You know, it's got to be an ego thing. Man, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm leading the league in scoring. I got one goal. One goal, yeah. It's, you know, I think it's an anger thing that, Plus, it's a divisional thing. Yeah, but, um, they're but, but again, fighting for first place. Yeah, but again, you can't let anger control the way you play the game because that's where you can make your mistakes. So. Uh, absolutely. Uh, anger could cost you. You, know, you could find yourself now for nothing real quick because you're just running around hitting people, you know, and trying to make a point, and then they're just keeping their calm and they're putting them in the neck. So, you know, I agree with you. you, you could, that anger is. Probably going to hurt you more than it's going to help you, but I don't think it's going to matter in this game. It's just too much talent for Rochester. Yeah. They fall behind. They have the talent to come back. Now, the other game we have, you got Colorado at Calgary. Uh, Calgary's coming off that huge win last week, 16-8. to uh, Colorado is coming off that heartbreaking loss to Saskatchewan. They are on the road in Calgary. Um, a Colorado loss kind of brings Calgary a little bit closer. Uh, it'll bring them to three and five. It'll drop Colorado to four and three. You know, be like a game and a half lead. But I don't know. I'm still not convinced. With Calgary, even though they are playing at home, I still think Colorado has has the tools to definitely be a solid, you know, the, the way Saskatchewan's playing, obviously, a solid number two team in the West. And I don't see them faltering to Calgary right now. I really don't. 
this is not the time uh, that Calgary wants to try to catch, you know, Colorado, you know, on a on on, on a uh, stumbling block, so to speak. Yeah, I, I, I can see. I don't know Calgary is going to be flying high. They're coming off that big, big win. Uh, Westberg is starting to find himself. He's starting to score some goals. Um, Del Bianco played probably the best game he played in the NLL. Unfortunately, that's not going to continue. Um, I agree. Colorado has just got too many weapons. They're just too strong for Calgary. Even though it's in Calgary, it's going to be another one. It's going to be a battle. But I don't see Colorado losing this. They're, they're in desperate times right now. They have to pretty much win out. Uh, you know, we discussed that earlier. They, they pretty much have to win out to have a shot, and even then they might not have a shot. But they lose this game to Calgary. It's, uh, you know, a coach may be getting fired over this one. Yeah, well, they, they cannot lose this. No. Well, I don't think they're they're worried worrying about right now, oh, we need to win out so we can get first place. They just want to get back on the winning track, yeah. start, start righting the ship, and then, you know, as long as they take care of their own, then let the chips fall where they may. You know, you, you yeah, take I care think, of it from I there. I agree. I think they're at Colorado's point. Now, let's win every ship. We'll win every period. We win the game. We play next week. Week. That's and, it. And, you know, you, I mean, it's too early in the season to get that desperate. So uh, I may have, you know, jumped the gun a little bit. But if they lose, uh, it is time to get desperate. Yeah. You know, cause because then you're going to be looking at, you know, the next game we're going to bring up. Yeah, you're going to be possibly four games behind with nine to play. It's right. not going to happen. Right, because now so, the next... Yeah, so, you know, so, so I guess that's where we go. I'm going to go with Colorado. Colorado. On that one. Yeah, same you know, here. Just do, basically just do that. They have to win. Win, yeah, same here. Now, next game we're talking about, you got Saskatchewan at Vancouver. Uh, Kevin, like, like, like you said, should Colorado lose, Saskatchewan wins... You're looking at three games plus the tiebreaker. That's a four-game uh, swap, even though Colorado still has two games in hand. So that could drop it down to three games. But this is where you don't want to lose right now. Okay? You really don't. You don't want to give Saskatchewan any more room. Now, that's not saying that Vancouver can't beat Saskatchewan. But the way... Saskatchewan is playing the way they played last week. That was coming off of another game. Um, this game, I don't think this game is going to be close. I really don't. This is Saskatchewan's only game this week. They're rested. Vancouver, it's a Vancouver's only game as well. They're going to be rested, but I just think uh, this is where Saskatchewan gets back to averaging 17, 18 goals a game. I agree. I was actually going to say this could be one of these 18 to 8 games. Um, Vancouver couldn't beat a tired Saskatchewan team. They're, they're not going to beat a fresh Saskatchewan oh, team. I think you know, they're, they're still a little, little angry over that loss. And, you know, I think now they're just, at this point, I think they're just going to tweak and they're going to play with Vancouver. Just, all right, let's flex our muscles and show what we can do, send the message. You know, maybe I'm exaggerating that, but I just don't see Vancouver winning this game. You know, they could put all three goalies in there and that at the same time, it's not going to matter. No, no. This is going to be ugly. There's some, uh, and I hate to do that because the last time I did that, I looked bad, but I don't care. Yeah. I, I look bad. Yeah. Give me something to laugh at. Laugh at yeah. I think. I think Saskatchewan wins this by 10 goals. Yeah. I'm not going to say how much they win it by, but it, they're, they're, they're going to have control of this game. What I'm going to be looking for is to see how Pat Saunders plays alongside of uh, Reese Dutch and Logan Shush and, you know. And, and Pat Sanders. Don't yeah. forget him. No, yeah, can't forget him either. So, <laughs> so, so, so I'm kind of curious to see how they, you know, all you know in, intertwine there, and yeah, I, I, I mean, to echo your point, um, how quickly are they going to mesh? Because yeah, and a lot of these, a lot of these guys play for the Western Lacrosse Association. They play with different teams and they play together. I'm not sure if that's a situation with with Saunders and Dutch and those guys, but 
but, you know, he, it may take him a week or two to get acclimated to the offense and playing with them guys, or maybe they played enough together already, but right. that, that could be some foresight as to what the trade was. I don't I don't know the answer to that, Right. but I, it's going to go either way. Either he's way, gonna, yeah. He'll be okay. He'll contribute, but I think he's going to contribute later on in the year when, he, when he's learned the tendencies of of what Dutch does and Smalls right. does. And, and yeah. Again, it, it, he may already have played with them. He might know. No, right. Now, so, yeah, we don't know. Now, you know. Now, now, the one good good thing about this game, personally for me, um, it is in the Langley Event Center, Vancouver's home game, which means one thing. Jake Elliott is on the call. Uh, yeah, that's always good. If anybody who listens to this podcast... If you ever, ever want to hear a game called and just be enamored with how the game is called, listen to this game. Listen to Saskatchewan at Vancouver. Any Vancouver home game, Jumbo Jake Elliott makes the call. He's obviously worked for Vancouver stuff, but he calls the game right down the middle. I mean, he will tell you how how it is and the way he calls the game is like you you, you wanna know who who he reminds me of? Kind of the old days I, I, I think I know where we're going with this. Look ahead. The old days of Flyers hockey with Gene Hart. Yes. Absolutely. I, I, yes. And I wanted to take your point and say yeah, as Philadelphians and Philadelphia fans, we were spoiled because we had the best. We had Gene Hart doing the Flyers. We had Richie Ashburn and Harry Callis doing yeah. the Phillies. I dare anybody give me anybody better than any of those guys. Those guys, you would turn on your transistor radio in school, you know, coming home doing your homework and the Phillies game is on. We turned on our AM, FM transistor yeah. radio. And Gene Hart, he made you feel as though you were actually looking at the game. Yes. Where's your home team going from right to left? Yep. And uh, yeah, it, that was the greatest thing. Listen to Gene Hart. He, he just, he was unbelievable. And same thing with Harry and Woody. And that's what, what Jumbo reminds me of. Yep. He, he, he just paints a picture, I guess, as we could say. And that's, I, I think that's a compliment. You don't, yep. you don't, you know. You, you don't tell me the game. You're not nope. you know, telling me what's going on. You were painting a picture of the game. Yep. So you can almost close your eyes and you go there. Yeah. Now, That's, now, in, now to play the other side of the tracks, now, you mentioned Harry and Whitey being the best. Now, I know there's other people out there that will dispute that because you had in Chicago. Yeah, we won't stay on this topic for long because you have another game to do. You know, you had Harry Carey in Chicago. You had the late, great Vince Scully in Los Angeles. I mean, you know, you have other guys that are above and beyond. But here in Philly, we we did get spoiled with having Harry Callis and Richie Ashburn for all those years. Uh, now we have Merrill Reese doing the Philadelphia Eagles. So, you know, you, when you have an announcer for so long, yes, you get spoiled. And in the National Lacrosse League... Jumbo Elliott yeah. is the best. And I had the honor of meeting him last year when Vancouver played New England. I went I went to New England to, to, to watch one of the games. And he they actually flew the, the, the families out and everything. And he was actually there. And I actually got to meet him. And he, he was one of the people that helped me do the podcast. He really was. He told me just to go ahead and fo- follow my dream to do it, talk about the game that I love, and just let it go. And, you know, five, five six years later, I'm still doing it. And not only is he probably, without a doubt, the best NFL broadcaster, he is one, I'm, 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 excuse my language, he is one hell of a human being. He's the nicest guy in the world. He will help you with anything. Yep. I had the absolute privilege of interviewing him. It, it was so, wow, he was like a storyteller. Yeah. Wow, I was so mesmerized just listening to him. Thinking, man, this guy is like, 
the greatest. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to, you know, we, we don't get nuts on it, but, you know, he is. He's far and away the best. And like you said, he'll help you. He, he helped you. You know, he gave you that boot in the butt. So, yeah, yeah. go for it. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't question it. Go for it. Yeah. And Jake has a unique ability of, of uh, just he sells you an idea or he takes your idea and he spins it on you and you say, man, that's pretty good idea. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Well, now, I don't want to take... living proof of that. that you know, he, he gave you the impetus to do it. Yeah. No, I ain't taking anything... You needed it, but, you know, he gave you that impetus. Yeah, and I ain't taking anything away from any of the other announcers in, in the NLL. In, in, in Rochester, you got Ripper. You got Craig, yeah, Craig Rid, uh, Rizinski, another great announcer out there, okay? Oh, yeah, Craig, yes. I yeah, agree. I mean, and, 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 and another guy that you would have a, a, a pleasure of talking to, yeah, talking the game of lacrosse, and he describes it just as just as good. I mean, he, he's great out there. Um, in Toronto, you got Andy McNamara and Brian Shanahan, Okay. They do, and every, every once in a while, Stephen Stamp will, will join their, their telecast. So the league has a a bunch of well well laid out announcers, but for anyone who, like I said, listens to the podcast and you know they're watching the games and their friends are like, oh, what's indoor lacrosse or you know, anything like that, just listen to the Saskatchewan Vancouver game. I mean, just jump, jump out. Jake just takes it to another level. Okay, he's just that good. Um, and 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 Jake is, I believe, the only person to have won the Tom Borelli Award twice. twice. Yes. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he's the only one that's ever done that. Yes, he has. Yeah, and that that's just an incredible honor. I, you know, yeah. I, I, I just, wow, you know, being voted by your peers is the best in the business. And like you said, that, that there's some quality. Every every team has a quality, you know, play by play. You know, we don't always see them or hear them because it's not our city. You know, but you know, Jake, because we both personally have dealt with them, as, you know, and yeah. It's just, you know, there's not a bad one in the league, but I think just, I think we agree. Jake is you know, a little step ahead of the rest little, of them. Little step ahead of the rest. They're all, they're all great. Yeah. Now, you know, Andy McNamara, Stephen Stamp, I mean, the list goes on and on. You just threw a bunch of names out there. And, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, listen to, and they are the best advertisement for the game. For the game. That, that, that we have just okay you don't know box the cost okay I know you want to see it but listen to these guys and then wow you know they, they take it to another level they another know? level and, yeah. and Jake when uh, the one uh, the Vancouver game when they were getting absolutely pummeled I get the Toronto game and even Jake said you know what it's even hard to call this game yeah isn't it that's the kind of thing I like to hear. Don't tell me, oh, we're coming back. You know, it's, yeah, that's great stuff. Yeah, it's even hard to call this game to watch it. You know, that's, that's, you know, that's the stuff that I like and you like. And I hopefully people who are listening say, yeah, I like that. And the guy's telling me that this is not the greatest game in the world, but he's selling it to me. Selling it, right. Now, now, the last game we have is Rochester at Georgia. Um... This is going to be after Rochester faces Toronto on Saturday night and after Georgia faces Buffalo. So both of them are basically traveling from the same area. Georgia will be traveling home from Buffalo and Rochester will be traveling to Georgia from Rochester only an hour apart. Um, Again, we said that Rochester cannot afford to lose both games this weekend. Um... Unfortunately, I think they are. Yep. Georgia coming home, uh, depending on what they do against Buffalo, I see them coming home. I, I, I don't know. I see them beating Rochester, Georgia. I really do. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of another... And my dogs are going nuts. <laughs> Oh, it's good. Who let the dogs out? Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> the underdogs. Uh, I I just <coughs> excuse me. 
I just see Georgia, you know, after they get disposed of Buffalo, and especially if they have an easy time with them, depending on how that game goes. I I, I don't I just can't see Rochester. I'm I'm picking Georgia in this game because I just can't see Rochester winning this. But something in the back of my head is telling me that you know what, Rochester's going to win this game. But I'm going Georgia because this would be the game that Rochester wins. Everything points to Georgia's a better team. They have more talent. Um, you know, it's, it, they should blow them out. If they're both traveling. Everything that you look at says Georgia. Well, I wouldn't say, I would say, say so much. Rochester. I wouldn't say so much blowing them out. I wouldn't say so much blowing them out. I'm looking at it where Rochester has lost already five in a row. The night before they're playing Toronto, who, as we said, is a little pissed right now after what they were embarrassed by at home. So they want to make a statement and it's the only game Toronto is playing this weekend. So as as they like to say, they're going to go balls to the wall in this game. Yes. So that might put a big hurt on on Rochester. And if the game is already out of hand by a certain point, you're going to see Matt Vince being pulled and Goodleaf be put in and they're going to tell Vince, hey, rest up for tomorrow night. And then they're going to have to travel to Georgia, and depending on what Georgia does to Buffalo or what happens there, I, I don't know. I just, like I said, I'm going Georgia, but some something in the back of my mind is going to tell me that Rochester is going to find a way to pull this game out. And, and, and in a way, I hope they do so they can right the ship and get back on track. But what, when, when I look at it, I don't, I, I just can't see them winning this game, especially after coming off a game against Toronto that Toronto just may blow the doors off. Uh, yeah, I, I, I see the point, that, and I agree, but I just I just think the way the season's going, it's, just been, it's so screwy all year. I think, I don't my gut says Georgia, but I'm, I'm thinking Rochester. And, you know, I have to echo back to what you said in the beginning of the show. This, this may be the most critical week of the season because there's either going to be some separation or there's going to be a whole lot more people close together. Yeah. And I think if Rochester loses both games, I think they petition the National Cross League to go to the Western Conference so they have a playoff spot yeah. because they would be in the playoffs. But, you know, that's me being a knucklehead. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I, th- I think that this, this, every one of these games can go either way. I mean, you know, we said Saskatchewan an easy win, but we said that before. Uh, you know, it's, it's there's a whole lot of variables, and it, it, you know, Colorado. You got to look at the teams who have a must win situation. You got Rochester. You got pretty much got Colorado. Calgary is a must win because they they want to make some distance between them and Vancouver because right. they have to figure going in. Vancouver's going to lose, so we need to win this. We'll get a two game lead. We're good, and you know. That's why they play the games, because we don't know what's going to happen. happen and, yeah. you know, the, the goaltending situation throughout every team, well, not every team, but the top four teams are goaltending pretty set. Uh, it's, you know, Calgary's got issues. Buffalo has issues. Vancouver certainly has issues. Rochester's got Vance. I, I personally think this is his last year. I, I think they're going to expose him to the draft, and he's going to just walk away. I, what's, he, what, what's he, Rocco, 40, 41? Oh. No, he's, he's not a kid, right? Vince? And he's, uh, Matt Vince. He's not that old. He's, yeah, he's like 40, right? No, I don't, I don't think he's that old. But he's, uh, yeah, my point, 35. He's, he may not be, but he's, you know, he's 35. probably got 10, 35, oh, uh-huh, then I stand correct, because I thought he was older than that, but, no. you know, he'll so be, he's got some time left, he's he'll been be, playing he'll be 36. Well. He'll it just be. doesn't have much in front of him, he did in the beginning of the year, what happened, yeah. and, you know, we don't know, but, you know, the goaltending is definitely, and did you, not to change gears again, did you read the thing that came out from the commissioner? Uh, about the uh, expansion draft. No. Uh, how many how many players each team could protect? Well, from what I what I heard before, it was five offense, five defense slash transition, one goalie. And then I, I, and that's pretty 
pretty much what it was, but then they said there's an option where you don't have to protect the goalie. And you can add another, they call him, a, he, he called them a runner. He, yeah, the runner, okay. He didn't, pitch, he didn't pigeonhole offense, defense, transition. He said a runner. A runner, yeah, but, so it could be either. Yeah, when I read the article, I'm thinking, I don't think he's right. Uh, because he said, yeah, every team is going to lose one player maximum. And uh, you and I, I think we agree that it's been said from day one, they're going to lose two. Yeah. But, and, you know, even the guy, I, I think it was Stanford that wrote it, said that I think the commissioner's mistaken because every team is going to lose two. Yeah. Um, so it's up there. I don't you know. And, um, they're going to alternate. Whoever gets the first number one, whoever gets the number one in the first round, the other team gets the number one. And, you know, obviously, they're going to alternate first and second. Yeah. Uh, throughout the draft. I guess that's going to be a coin toss. I, I don't know who what knows. you heard on that. Uh, I don't know how you determine who gets what. Is there any talk of a territorial type thing where, um, you know, San Diego only gets West Coast guys no. and Philly gets East Coast, or is it just wide open? No, there hasn't been any, anything brought up with that. There hasn't even been any talk about whether or not there's going to be pullbacks. Okay. So yeah, we, I, we don't know yet. Know that, Everything. Yeah. The only thing it's been been talked about is five and five in the goalie, or five five in a runner and no goalie. So it could be anything. We won't know until it gets until it gets closer. But before we end the show, real quick, uh, yes. this game is very important for Rochester this weekend, really, because next weekend they return home and they got to play Saskatchewan. So, so if they lose both games this weekend, not only is that a seven-game losing streak, but now they got to return home and play Saskatchewan. Uh, yeah. So that's why I said earlier they cannot afford to lose both games this weekend because next week the rush come into town, and that could be deadly. Yeah, that that would be that would make them if they lose both, that would probably make them two and eight. Yes. And that's when it's you know, folded yeah, up to exactly. that point. You know, exactly. It's about, I mean, there's no way you're gonna win after the eight five hundred. No. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, that's the one team more than any that surprises me because I you know, I watched them again in the years we all did but wow, this team's you know, they're, they're pretty good. And you know, what happened? You know, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, that's the beauty of this league. Uh, it changes from week to week. And New England was another team who, you know, I thought they were, you know, dominant, but then they've had a couple hiccups. And they're still right there in first place. But I think you agree. There was no way at this point in the season I thought Buffalo would be anywhere near first place. No. But yeah. they, they got a shot at it. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Kevin, I want to thank you for joining me, uh, for filling in for Gary. Um, we could go on and on and on, but <laughs> we don't want to try to, we don't want, we don't want the show to be too long. I mentioned to Jack yesterday, you want me to start talking on the call, we're going to be there for four hours. Yeah. But, I, I want to thank you for allowing me this opportunity. This has been such a great, uh, a great throw for me. I love doing this stuff, man. Anytime you can talk lacrosse to somebody who can handle what they're talking about, it's good. Yeah. You know? well, and, and again, thank you for your kind words last week. Uh, my family, thank you. I, I was really moved by that. Uh, so I don't want to dwell on that. That's, right. you know, but, it's in the past. I'm, I'm I look forward. I'm going your closing lines here. Yeah. Got, got to look forward. Well, we got two more weeks. Um... We'll see what happens this week. Things are going to change big time in the standings. Um, yeah. So, everybody, I know we went a little longer than usual. Uh, we wanted to give some kudos to, to Jake Elliott, obviously. Um, you know, as we said, one, one of the greats to call the games. Um, so, people who haven't really watched the game, listen to him call the game. You'll be enamored by it. You'll, it'll, it'll pull you right, right into it. And like I said, nothing from the other announcers. Ripper out in uh, Rochester, um, you know, and, you know, um, Andy McKay and um, Brian Shanahan, Stephen Stamp, all all the guys throughout the league—they do a fantastic job. So, for Kevin Nabauer at LaxPhilly.com, I'm Rocco Granado from InLacrosseWeTrust.com. We thank you for joining us behind the bench. 
and we'll see everybody here again next week.